Um, I'll get started. Um, before I, um, I talk about or get into the topic, I would like to uh, say a few words. In recent years, uh, my reading of Ibn Arabi has been progressing in an expanding conceptual space. Um, I've, my interest um, um, in Ibn Arabi was not just focused on, uh, on his work. Um, I've been reading in many other fields. Um, my interest in causality, for example, um, which is the focus of uh, this talk stems from my reading in history of science. Um, and um, um, in, my, in this expanding scope, I'm not trying to you know, continue my work as an expert in Ibn Arabi's um, uh, thought, but I'm trying to um, make Ibn Arabi more relevant um, to us today. So I continue reading him in a wider context, so not just in the context of his own work and trying to explain um, his own theory or his own, uh, his own thought as a sort of a medieval thinker. So um, um, this is the um, uh, one of the purpose why I had decided to, um, to talk about um, causality rather than sort of working on the, uh, on the things that I've actually um, um, written about uh, in the past. So this talk is an introductory talk to the concept of causality. It's quite a complex uh, topic and I'm hoping that uh, I will make some uh, um, useful interpretations of uh, his work. So at the start, uh, let me um, just to briefly refer to what I mean by causality or what's generally understood by causality. Um, causality or causations are generally understood as the relationship between cause and effect. Uh, this is the simple definition. It is, it's also um, understood as the um, principle that everything has a cause um, in our world. And in relation to that, um, causality um, is also understood as a notion indicating how nature works and how the world progresses. So, uh, so there is a several level to this, but the simple level that I will be um, um, working with is really that uh, relationship between cause and effect. Um, so let's look at the concept of um, geometry of reality, which has been proposed as the, uh, the topic for this series, which is quite an interesting topic and it's quite sort of inspiring in its own right. And uh, um, when I started thinking about the geometry of reality as a, as a topic, I wanted to um, um, sort of put it in a wider context. So when we look at reality in itself, we have to sort of think about the sources, um, the sources that uh, um, from which that reality emerged. So here I'm going to refer to um, sort of two states from which um, reality emerged. And this is according to um, uh, Mullah Sadra, uh, Sadr al-Din Shirazi, 17th century um, um, thinker, where he actually talked about the notion of Ibda and the notion of Tequim. He said the, the originations of the world and the way things emerged um, um, is divided according to uh, uh, these two the concept. Now, if we think about those in terms of geometry, I would actually say that this is the geometry of origination and this is the geometry of formation. Now, I'm, I'm using simple terms so that you can um, keep up with the um, uh, sort of complexity of the topic. Um, there are other words that I could use, but I'm going to just use those terms for time being. Now, um, these two um, have been um, explained by Mullah Sadra as the, to start with, like Al Ibda is is the originations of the ideas in the mind of the of the originator or God um, from that perspective only. So uh, the the things has has no um, uh, kind of impact on the uh, um, on the originator, um, and in Ibn Arabi's um, he referred to those duality and actually he referred to this as al fayd al aqdas um, which he described as the state where the immutable entities emerge. Now, the, at the Queen, um, Mullah Sadra talks about a participation um, from the things that has already emerged in the mind of the, uh, uh, the originator. So, 
So they have role to play. Where, whereas Ibda, they have no role to play because they just come out of nothing in the mind of the uh, uh, originator. Uh, Ibn Arabi referred to this as al fayd al-Muqaddas, um, which is uh, the, uh, the appearance of the immutable entities as external entities. All right, let me actually, um, if, I, if I am to use my, um, uh, my profession as a way of thinking about those, I would actually say that this, uh, the ibda is relation to the design ideas and the, uh, um, the um, uh, at the queen relates to the materialization. So if I think of an architect who's come up with an idea of a house, for example. And uh, so the idea in itself as it emerged in the mind of the designer is independent. Whereas once the designer wants to materialize that, then the, the, the designer would have to think of uh, materials, would have to think of you know, construction techniques, would have to think of all kinds of things, um, even project management in order to sort of get that done. That is completely different from the idea itself. Um, and Nabulusi, who's a, a follower of Ibn Arabi, is a 17th, 18th century thinker on whom I actually spend, uh, I worked quite a lot, gave an interesting example about how you can think of the two together. He says that if I now sort of um, switch um, the slide on, you're actually seeing nothing, right? You're seeing actually complete darkness. He said, you've got to think, and that was, he said, you've got to think of the situations where um, there's a state of darkness, um, but in that darkness, there is everything. So if you turn on the lights, and the light immediately reveal everything. Um, there's no kind of stages in the process. So when we talk about two Abda and Taqween, they are conceptual in their separation, but they are not temporal. So everything emerges, you know, once you turn on the light, everything emerges. And this has created quite an interesting dilemma, in fact, uh, in, the, uh, in the mind of the, uh, the Sufis, which is represented by that, uh, um, uh, line that uh, Ibn Arabi wrote, and then Nabulsi also talked about, uh, which also raises the issues of um, um, here you've got something like um, a blade and something that is actually, that already exists in that darkness. I'm using here Hagia Sophia uh, being in, the, uh, in the, uh, the, the press quite prominently recently. But um, um, the, the, the duality you refer to all the things that exist, and then the lights. You know, without the lights, those would actually not appear. So you've got duality, and the question is, which actually comes first? Those ideas which exist in the darkness, like the immutable entities, or the light that actually make them? Uh, we'll get to that a little bit later, but here with that, with that image, I wanted to emphasize that there is the form of the building, which would say, considering that sort of all objects that exist in the world, and there are human beings in there. And this is where the, the issue of causality becomes so important. So let's look at um, the difference between the geometry of originations and the geometry of formations. Now, if we, if we look at how Ibn Arabi presented those, um, this is one of the um, geometrical diagram that has been used um, in the, um, um, in the series before, and it refers to a particular geometrical representations of those original ideas. So the geometry of originations is regular, it emphasizes unity um, of the source, and it presents the underlying order of the, um, um, of the, of the creation. So uh, if you compare it, for example, with this, which is also um, um, geometrical representation that exists in various um, manuscripts of al Futuhat, they are co of completely different order, right? You've, you've actually, you've got one which has a sort of a simple order of quadrature that plays as a sort of underlying order of the creations, how multiplicity proceeded from the, from the one in, in their own right. They, and then you've got a kind of a messy, um, a, a messy diagram. Uh, which represent the geometry of formation. It's irregular, it emphasizes duality and the complex relationship between, uh, that binds the designer with the, with, with the creation, with the source and the product. So let's look closely at, uh, 
Um, at the, um, uh, that diagram, which I sort of refer to as representing the geometry of causality, um, you will find that the way that it's actually been presented, it's, these are the same diagram presented in different manuscripts, by the way, and you can actually find also that same diagram in different, uh, um, shown in different works of Ibn Arabi. Um, you have here on top, you have the divine, or the realm of the divine, and here you've got the human. Now suddenly that is quite different to the geometry of the uh, um, of, um, um, of origination, because there is no duality in that. There is the source and all the order that comes out of it, and it, it does not actually deal with those relationships. Now, you've got the divine on one side, you've got the human on side, and then it comes something that actually even make things more complex, which is the issue of time. Now, this is where things started to become um, um, sort of very uh, perplexing in terms of how you can get actually the divine and the human working together. So the main question that has been um, central to um, mystical and religious thinking throughout the um, uh, medieval time, even uh, uh, up, to, up till now, is how to keep God independent of, yet in, um, effectively engage in the affairs of the physical world because of that duality. Now, if you look at, at the writings of the jurists, for example, and uh, like Al-Fuqaha, Al-Mutakallimi, most of, most of those would actually prefer to keep the two separate. They argue for two modes of being. They would say God's mode of being is different from a human uh, 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 mode of being, and there has to be separation between the two so that you can actually, in terms of coming back to the, um, the duality that Mullah Sadra has given us, so that al-ibda and the first ideas is actually that appeared, that appeared in the divine mind remain independent of you know, all that sort of management of the mess that actually takes place with the uh, emergence of time and the emergence of the human. So this is where causality becomes such an important aspect of um, um, religious thinking, and not just religious thinking, scientific thinking, and, if, um, and, and all other aspects to do with religion, for this, for a number of reasons. First of all, you've got free will and determination, or, uh, or determinism, um, whereas, you know, the question of how are people, do have people have a free will, or everything um, is already a predetermined um, eternally by the divine, and uh, um, it is just a matter of, you know, people doing what has already been predestined for them to do. You've got the issue of religious obligations, but, um, uh, the concept of a taklif, in, uh, particularly in Arabic. Um, and that taklif is, comes from, you know, from the divine, that uh, you, you know, humans have to do certain things in order to um, um, uh, fulfill their religious obligations. And then the question becomes, you know, why do we have taklif if everything's already determined? Um, you've got the reward and punishment, which is follows from the issues of taklif, and then you've got the if even if you stayed outside the um, um, stayed outside religion altogether, you've got the issue of social and moral responsibility, which means that even those simple concepts, um, um, if we if people don't have a free will, if everything's determined according to the uh, divine eternal plan, um, would actually make no sense. And in fact, even science has started to started to present um, um, sort of evidence that the world is determined that there's no space for free will. And uh, and then you've got the whole sort of discussions about causations. We've got event causation, agent causations, and object uh, causations. Those are quite different. Like for example, if you've got sort of if you you know been involved in a car accident, this is an event that sort of have certain causes that led to it. But if you have, for example, if, if you are naturally as a human being or as a sort of just all animals that eat, they grow, um, there are causes and effect there that you've got, you've got no choice in that. And then you've got the, the Asian cause, and this is the important part that related to us uh, uh, here, that, um, that you have choices. You know, this is quite different to you eating and growing because this is, you've got a cause and effect there, but you've got no, um, no choice, no will, no, um, um, uh, no agency in that. But, but once you've got your 
um, no sort of intentions and your choice, then it becomes problematic. You know, where that choice come from? Do you have a free will or is that choice uh, being predetermined? Then you've got you've got a whole discourse that that has not actually been even um, discussed deeply enough about the um, cause and effect, which is particularly the form of which has which is a kind of a layer that that is quite different to cause and effect. Because there could be cause and effect, but a tethir is actually something different that uh, particularly the theologians have talked about. And that actually comes into the, uh, the, this process, and I will explain it a little bit later. And then you've got the, the creation of a human action, um, because people do act in certain ways. And, and what are the causality for, for those um, type of actions? And in the end is the working of nature, which is all now um, the realm of science is, um, um, is everything sort of related to natural laws or, if, or you know, to what extent that God uh, plays a role in, uh, in, in these things. So let's uh, move um, to uh, then the next concept that, that related to those, which is, which are the concepts of Al-Qadha wal Al-Qadha. That has been, um, it can be translated as decree and destiny. And those related to the concept of causality directly. Those has been um, um, explained or be translated as eternal determinations and timed occurrences. So the decree, which is Al-Qadha, is the eternal determinations, and then um, um, Al-Qadha is timed uh, occurrences. Uh, in, the, in the Arabic sources, they refer to them as Al-Qadha la tawqita lahu. Right? So there are two different things. And the two different things, um, so in English, the decree involves no time or no timing, and destiny is the unfolding of what's being decreed in time. So that is why time is an important concept in the whole um, um, a structure of Al Qadar or Al Qadar. So if I am going to uh, sort of make a representation, as a as a way of you know um, sort of um, establishing the uh, sort of the conventional way of thinking about those topics, we will uh, we will have uh, say the the arrow of time extending in one in, in one direction, and then you've got the originations with which um, um, we will align al qadar and then formation. The formation goes with time because the formations there are things continually occurring. The fact that we are all together here and I'm talking to you and you're listening to me, it's all part of that, that unfolding of the, uh, um, um, of destiny. So Al-Qadha, because it involves no time and it is related to the Al-Ibda and the idea of origination that uh, Mullah Sadra talked about, we can say put them at certain, at one end, whereas formations and Al-Qadha will, uh, we will put it um, uh, that in, and then, which is which is kind of <clears throat> um, uh, um, represent the way even the way destiny is being sort of conceived in uh, uh, in English. Destiny is the is the force that controls worldly occurrences according to a predestined eternal time. Destiny here. Um, kind of bring al qadar or al qadar or decree and destiny together. It doesn't actually separate them in the way that's separated in uh, um, uh, in Arabic. But here I wanted to to bring an important aspect because that's going to play an important role in the way that we will interpret those. I'm going to bring in two temporal concepts or three temporal concepts in Arabic: al azal, al abad, and al sarman. Okay, so al azal wal abad in Arabic. Um, they actually have a particular um, um, position in time, even though that they are actually expression of eternity, but whereas eternity in English tend to go beyond time, those actually have time. Like, you know, we say in Arabic, min al-azal ila al-abad. We don't say min al-abad ila al-azal. It just doesn't work that way. So there is a, there is a direction. And a sarmad, even though that the sarmad would... Um, um, imply um, a condition beyond time, but it actually it represents a duration that is um, 
coexistence with time, but it is a divine duration. So if you want to translate Ezel to, uh, to English, you will say pre-eternity, and if you want to translate Abad, you say post-eternity, and the duration between pre-eternity to post-eternity becomes a sermon. Now, this is all absurd in English because, because eternities have no time, so how you can actually have that duration? But in Arabic, it does have duration, and in fact, Sufis talks about that duration, and they talk about the, uh, the divine days, uh, um, and even the year, the Al-Ayyam, uh, they, they actually talk about them because they, they bring time in a particular way to the divine that actually um, um, corresponds with the human time. All right, so this is the, the, the basic setup before I move to Ibn Arabi states. But before I do that, I'm going to refer to a couple of things. Um, so far, when we talk about the geometry of reality, we're really talking about... about um, um, the uh, sort of the creator as a designer. Uh, we use the, the compass as a symbol. We know the sort of regular geometry that has actually been used. Um, um, and here is the sort of representations of, um, 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 of the creator as a geometer that, that, that designed the world according to geometrical order. But really, when you start talking about the, uh, the geometry of formation, which is about the management of the world, you're, really, you're not really talking about God as a designer. You're talking about God as a judge. And all the rhetoric, all the terminology that is used in, uh, um, um, uh, by Ibn Arabi and others about the, um, the geometry of... Um, of formation, as I describe it, or about the, the that management of the human conditions is really um, is a, is the language of the court. Al Qada is the legal system in Arabic. Al Qadi is the judge, um, and uh, and what the judge does is the ruling, and so you have those ruling in the way that uh, um, the um, Ibn Arabi describe how things occur. So we really don't have a campus. You know, the compass that we use in the geometry of, uh, of uh, origination uh, becomes a, a gavel. So really, you've got to actually keep that in mind because this is important to understand the context from um, in which Ibn Arabi writes um, about Al-Qadda wal qadr So Ibn Arabi, um, in the chapter 14, Ibn Arabi writes, uh, the decree, Al-Qadda, the decree is God's ruling concerning things. So I'm trying here to use the legal term, so I'm using ruling, uh, even though that some would actually say determination, but I'm using ruling because I want to be um, um, faithful to the, um, um, to the context. So he says, the decree is God's ruling concerning things, and God's ruling concerning things is in accordance with his knowledge of them and in them. Now, the, the them here refer to the things, and then he says that God's knowledge in, th in things is what the knowable matter reveal of the way in which they are in themselves. Now, here I wanted to um, dwell on uh, an important um, aspect of this text, which is um, God knowledge um, of things and in things, right? He made it quite clear, ilmuhu biha wa fiha. Now, in the subsequent sentence, he would actually say, "Ilmullahi fil ashya." I mean, he now explaining "Ilmuhu fiha." Alama atatu al ma'lumat min ma hiya alehi fi nafsu. Here is actually he make a distinction. He make a distinction between "Ilmuhu biha" wa "Ilmuhu fiha." Now, in Arabic, "Ilmuhu biha" is really quite straightforward. You would understand that, but "Ilmuhu fiha." You know, this has been a mystery for me, and I've been sort of, for years, I've been trying to work out what is that El Muhufiha means. It is not the same as El Muhufiha. If it was the same as El Muhufiha, or his knowledge of things, he wouldn't actually put it, put it uh, in, this, uh, in this manner. And I looked at the, uh, um, the commentaries, and neither Al-Qashani, nor Jami, nor Qaisari, nor Nabulsi actually shed light on this. Uh, the difference between ilmuhu biha wa ilmuhu fiha. Um, the, only, the only commentator that I came across that actually shed some light, but even sort of makes it more complex, is al-Busnawi. 
Albuzna who dwells on this and makes some interesting remarks, but not necessarily in the end that I found that, you know, unravel the, um, uh, the secret of this. So Ibn Arabi continues and, so, and says that, um, explaining how um, God um, rule uh, concerning things or rule upon things, is that thus the decree, the decrees ruling upon things could only be effectively achieved through them. So now he's referring to the things, to the agency of the things in his own ruling. So the, we go back to the, um, we go back to the um, um, Mullah Sadra, and Mullah Sadra make it quite clear that, you know, in the formation, the things have a um, role to play in what actually uh, God decides. So here is Ibn Arabi is actually making similar, similar remarks. Uh, now this is quite important. We'll get back uh, again to this. And then Ibn Arabi says, and this is destiny's essential secret. So this is where the secret lies, according to Ibn Arabi. فَمَا حَكَمَ الْقَضَاءُ عَلَى الْأَشْيَاءِ إِلَّا بِهَا So this is, you know, the agency. Now, if you read Al-Busnawi, Al-Busnawi adds another layer trying to explain what is the meaning of ilmuhu fiha. And he says, the, rulings of, uh, the ruling of noble matters upon God is the secret of, is the, secret of the destiny secret. Uh, now he actually sort of just added another layer of mystery to the whole, um, to the whole uh, conception. He says, وَحُكْمُ الْمَعْلُومَاتِ عَلَى اللَّهِ هُوَ سِرُّ سِرِّ الْقَدَرِ So here at least now we have two situations. We have a situation where, where we, um, 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 we know that sort of the, the position of, that the, the position of al qada wal qadar from God's perspective, but then at the positions of al qada wal qadar from the things perspective. So because they have role to play, so if we understand how they actually rule upon God, then according to al-Buznawi, then we actually get to the secret of the secret of al uh, qadar Now, I will try to explain this a little bit better, but um, I don't think that you know, this is, makes it any clearer than uh, what Ibn Arabi has, uh, has said. So this is, in the end, the important bit. This is the crux of the matter, according to Ibn Arabi. He says, the ruler is subject to the dictates of the matter upon which he rules. I'm using masculine um, um, sort of sentences here or, uh, or uh, term because that's, that's how it is um, explained. So um, forgive me for that. Uh, but that's the nature, Arabic is gendered, and we, I'm trying to sort of be uh, faithful to the text. So the ruler is subject to the dictates of the matter upon which he rules, as necessitated by the matter's own nature. The one who is ruled upon does in his own way, in his own right, rule upon the ruler, dictating his ruling act. Thus, every ruler is ruled upon with and in what he rules, whosoever he might be. I'll read it in Arabic. The Arabic might actually be a little bit clearer to those who understand Arabic. فَالْحَاكِمُ فِي التَّحْقِيقِ تَابِعٌ لِعَيْنِ الْمَسْأَلَةِ الَّتِي يَحْكُمُ فِيهَا بِمَا تَقْتَضِيهِ ذَاتُهَا Referring to al-mas'ala. فَالْمَحْكُومُ عَلَيْهِ بِمَا هُوَ فِيهِ حَاكِمٌ عَلَى الْحَاكِمِ أَنْ يَحْكُمْ عَلَيْهِ بِذَلِكِ فكل حاكم محكوم عليه بما حكم به وفيه كان الحاكم من كان. Now I know that actually just make it a little bit more complex, but I will try to simplify it a little bit later. Here I'm, I'm taking the other um, text from Ibn Arabi. This is uh, the, the other one from Al Fusuz. This is from his Diwan. Um, uh, three lines of poetry, very important in connection with that. I'll start with the English. The, the, the English is not a direct translation. It just gives the, um, um, the gist of the, um, the content that is important for us. He said, destiny rules over things. But its ruling can only be effected through the thing's physical existence. So God's ruling, let's say, in, the, um, um, in eternity makes, um, doesn't mean anything. He said, uh, 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 its ruling... Uh, can only be effective, effected through the ruling's physical existence. Thus, ruling upon things is by the things themselves. 
I'll read it in Arabic um, for the benefit of those who uh, understand Arabic. In the fil ashya'i lil qadari, wa inna fihi majal al fikri wal ibari, wa qul bihi inna hu ala tahakkumihi la hukma fihi ala al arwahi wa suri illa bi aayaniha. This is the important bit. La hukma fihi ala al arwahi wa suri illa bi aayaniha. Faalam tariqatuh al hukm fiha laha. Now, this is where I actually wanted to dwell. This is where I've been sort of um, um, thinking about for, for years of trying to understand what does actually he mean, al hukmu fiha laha. Now, of course, I mean, you could actually mean quite a lot of things, but in my um, interpretation, I've been trying to, um, uh, to sort of give this a little bit of a, um, a clarity, at least in my mind. Uh, which I find it quite interesting because al hukmu fiha laha it changes the whole perspective of the way that we look about al qada wal qada. Now, al qada wal qada and the whole issue of um, uh, free will and um, determinism is that they they actually been sort of conceived in uh, in opposition. So either have free will or things that actually um, um, eternally determine. They haven't actually been sort of introduced as, you know, could they actually coexist together? Could actually find a way of, thing, uh, of them working together rather than actually being, you know, seeing them as being exclusive. So can we have a free will while actually being also determined? Um, most of the things that, most of the texts that I've, I've, I've read, and particularly the way that I've, you know, I showed you how we set them up uh, between the uh, um, sort of concept of Al-Qadda al qadar is always separate them. Always al qada something that occurred eternally, um, and then al qadar is something that occurred in time. Um, so here I wanted to see if we actually bring the two together, as I said here, where we bring the saramad was zaman, but eternity and time and eternity, al wa taqwin, al qada wa qadar, all we bring them together, occurring simultaneously in time. Then could we actually um, the my my task is to actually see whether we could. Uh, bring a different understanding. So this is what I try to sort of trace to see whether I could make a, some understanding. If, you, if we think about them together, we can see some understanding of what it means by al-hukmu fiha laha wa ilmu Allahi fil ashya. So the ruling, controlling things are affected by the things themselves. That's al-hukmu fiha laha. And God's knowledge within things, which is really not clear. I mean, how would God knowledge happen within things? I mean, there must be a mechanism, but it's still not clear to me. Um, the other thing is that that brings this um, um, into um, um, relevance is the concept of a uh, um, according to the Ash'ari. According to the Ash'ari, who's always sort of been seen as um, not really compatible with the Sufi, which I don't think that that is the case, uh, is that where um, uh, they talk about um, uh, God being the only um, Asian that that makes an effect. So, but not an effect in the sense like uh, a sabab or natija. It's a ta'thir is, is is something different. Uh, so it says that Allah Taala huwa al muathir wahda huwa inda al asbab la biha. So God creates an effect at the cause, not with it. So at which brings a situations of um, what I would say is you know being together with rather than uh, using those uh, causes as in an instrumental way. Uh, and that actually relates to the whole idea of al-hukmu fi halaha. So let me move on quickly to give you some examples um, of um, how I started to actually think about this with the help of other contemporary philosophers like uh, Gadamer, for example. Um, Gadamer in Truth and Method started to sort of give some information, sort of some analysis which I find it extremely useful to try to bring Ibn Arabi's insights um, to, um, uh, to relate to our contemporary understanding. So, so if we talk about concepts like, for example, culture, right? Culture, economy, um, and polity, you know, all those kind of universal concepts, we don't really know exactly what those concepts mean, like the notion themselves into universal form. We don't really know what they are, but we actually know what do they mean in a, a, at the level of the particular, like, you know, what happens in certain sort of what we consider cultural manifestations or 
the economic um, 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 manifestation through, for example, the, the chair markets or, or you know, various aspects of the economy and uh, you know, what happens through politics. But really, the concept themselves, the universal nature of those concepts is not really graspable in that way. Um, so here, according, according to this understanding, if we look at economy, culture and policy and similar kind of a universal state, those states of affair are graspable at the, at the level of the particular, but not the universal level. Um, they're graspable that we know what they are, but we don't actually know exactly what, what our knowledge of those mean. And the most important aspect is that once created, you know, once we have a culture, once we have economy, because the economy doesn't exist without people, and culture doesn't exist, with, and polity doesn't exist without people. So any group of people, they will create those conditions. So once created, they assume universal ontological autonomy that dictates the particular. And those states of control is actually independent of the, uh, um, um, of the will, of the intention, of the thinking of the individual. So when we say that sort of people have culture, the culture starts to dictate how this community who created the culture, they would, they would act. But the way it dictates them is not necessarily in accordance with the way they think what culture is. Now, this brings me to um, another uh, explanations by um, uh, Al Nabulsi of the concept of wujud, which is relevant to those states. He, he described Al Wujud um, in two ways. He said, in respect of its being manifest, like when we talk about existence or being, um, of being manifest, all sights and insights see it but cannot know it. Like, you know, if you talk about the culture in its manifest state, like in the level of the particular, all sight and insight see it but cannot know it. Um, in respect of its being hidden, however, like, you know, being or culture, that universal state that is hidden, that is not the one that is actually manifested, is it minds and thought know it but cannot see it. So you've got that kind of polarity, which is quite important. So let me move on from here to, um, uh, to two, two um, um, things that, uh, that Gadamer talks about, which is the spirit of conversation and the spirit of play, right? Um, those are important because we are now sort of moving in terms of the speed of events that, uh, that unfold in those situations. So the spirit of conversation, this is an interesting photo that's taken from uh, the um, 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 parliament setting in Ukraine. This is the Ukraine parliament. It's quite exciting, more exciting than the uh, Australian Parliament. Um, the um, what um, um, what uh, Gadamer says is that he said you know when you are in a situation where you say that you're conducting a conversation, that is not true because you cannot conduct a conversation. You can say you can say that you are sort of you participate in a con or you get involved in a in a conversation because the conversation has a spirit of its own, which you cannot conduct. You know, you can get into conversations, but you really don't know how things are going to unfold in the conversations because it depends on the situation. In each situation, any conversation could unfold in a completely different way. Now, what is it that actually determined the way that the conversation unfolded? Or what is it that made the Ukrainian sort of parliament act in that particular way? Of course, I mean, it is, no one wants that to happen. I mean, no one wants this uh, sort of uh, um, weird behavior to, to, to manifest. This is because, because it is beyond the control of the individual, beyond the control of their, of their consciousness, their will, their intentions. Uh, it is just, it has its own state. Now, I would like to refer here to a situation in Arabic where we call it al-hal. Um, al-hal is a kind of a circumstance that occurs at particular point in time in, in certain situations. And we have a word in Arabic which, which says, um, those who would actually know Arabic will say Ahad uh, al-Hal. When we say Ahad al-Hal, it means that this, this circumstance has actually taken control of that uh, person or, or the people and they've acted in a way that is not intended in the beginning because Ahad al-Hal or Ahad al-Hal. So al-Hal is a situation that is that, that circumstance that, that has its own dictate that beyond the control of the individual. Let's actually um, uh, accelerate 
let's accelerate the um, the human actions and look at at the spirit of uh, spirit of play. Now, the spirit of play here, we've actually moved into a situation where, um, in contrast to conversation, conversation the the conversions actually can think, have time to think and react and say certain things, even though that sometimes the dictates of the conversation completely take them you know, um, out of their original intention. But with the play is the action is faster. There's no time to think, right? And this particular photo, um, those who actually follow soccer would actually know what it is. Um, it, it is um, um, extraordinary moment um, in uh, the uh, 2006 World Cup final between France and Italy. And this is Zinedine Zidane hit button. Um, Matarazzi. Now, no one was anticipating this, and this has been actually uh, normalized by, uh, by this statue, um, which is in front of the Pompidou Center in, uh, in Paris. This particular moment was extremely uh, interesting because it, uh, um, um, no one was actually wanted to happen and no one was expecting it to happen and not the players and not anybody but nonetheless it actually took place so if we look at the and it took place early in the game if we look at the event um here is a sort of a, um, a screenshots of the um, of the way it unfolded um um zenedine zidane uh, uh, madurazzi said something to zenedine zidane and zidane turned and actually hit but and then we've got this frame this is the important frame the umpire has actually sent him out it was a red card sent uh, zenedine zidane out and in that action he actually according to uh, um um in arabic it's actually he's actually ruling it's exactly in the same way that that we talk about ruling like the the, the judge is ruling and in fact what is, what is interesting is that the umpire or the referee in Arabic is called hakam. And hakam come from a legal term, which is the one that actually um, uh, passes ruling. So, um, so here is the, the, the umpire um, um, uh, making a ruling on, on the player, right? According to, according to Ibn Arabi's interpretations, uh, which is every everyone that rules is actually ruled upon um, by um, and with which he's ruling. Here we can actually argue that all right, it was it was Zinedine Zidane's action who ruled upon the umpire and dictated his ruling action to send him out. So this is in this is when we say. Um, Al-Hukm uh, Fiha Laha. So he's, he's actually not acting out of his own volition, not acting out of his intention. He doesn't want to actually send anybody out, but it was the ruling of, uh, it was the, the actions of the uh, individual that acted upon the uh, umpire to send them out, to send them out. But this is at the level of the particular, the way that the, um, um, the, um, the events have unfolded. But if we look at the spirit of the play, it was the spirit of the play who dictated the game in such a way that uh, led the players to act in certain way, despite their will, despite their intention, they didn't want to actually do that. So that is the important bit, that there is, there is a kind of a, a circumstance, existential circumstance in each, uh, in each situation that dictates what people do. But those circumstances or those existential circumstances are not actually created by God eternal ruling. They're actually created by the people in that particular condition under in that particular moment in time, which eventually reveals um, um, the action that has actually happened. So if, if we are now to look at, uh, at the whole idea of Al-Qadar wal and uh, the whole notion of destiny and the way that the geometry of causality unfolds, we can actually say that, that everything appears um, um, simultaneously on, on the, um, um, the arrow of time, like the um, eternity, time and eternity, the origination of formations, decrees and destinies, they all um, appear simultaneously. They're not really 
they're not separated by um, sort of a beginning and then uh, um, a, a different mode that actually unfold different type of thing. So they all appear together. So in other words, people create their own destiny. Their action, by, by, by coming together, they create a circumstance, existential circumstance, and that existential circumstance is what determines uh, their actions. Uh, so al-Qada wa al is actually created by people and then they get they become subject to their ruling so this is what i would actually say that uh, um ibn arabi well this is my interpretation what ibn arabi would would actually say al um, fiha laha and i would like to end there thank you <laughs>